Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Complimentary Cinema here on the O&M Stockroom. We are your hosts, uh, Brian McGarry. And Ken O'Malley. And Ken, uh, what flaming piece of crap did we watch tonight? We watched um, Outgoing Beyond the Year of Our Lord 2036, (laughs) otherwise known as Unknown Origin? 2036, Origin Unknown. Origin Unknown, the very memorable title. Uh, Seen in 2020, uh, interest, uh, unfound. (laughs) So we just just spent uh, an hour and 34 minutes watching this uh this very oh god what's a good, what's a good word very ambitious film very ambitious they really they really tried hard with this one i would use the word pretentious that would work too um, that would work too <laughs> i don't know if ambitious is quite the right word well Did, so i'll put it this way i spent my time thinking about the quantum entanglement involved in this film and how I could quantumly entangle myself to go back in time to not have to see this film. <laughs> All right, so just taking just taking uh, a step back for a moment. So complimentary cinema. Uh, every week we uh, watch a movie that's free, uh, usually on YouTube, uh, that anybody can watch anywhere in the world without uh, paying anything. And then we watch it and then talk about it. And of course, there are going to be many, many spoilers in this. We're basically going to ruin the film for you if you have already, if you've never seen it. And if you've you've already seen it, I don't know why you would want to listen to us talk about it because I would not want anything more to do with this film after seeing it the one time. But that's me. So, uh, so Ken, do you want to, do you want to give us your, uh, your amazing synopsis on this film? All right. So this film is about a woman who talks to her sister and a robot and a military guy and then another guy we never see on a phone. This film, I I would summarize it as Katie Sackhoff's no good, very bad day at work. (laughs) It's an hour and a half of a woman at her office job with computers, talking to people, video conferencing. Talking on the phone, talking to a machine. There's a lot of talking in this film. So much. There's more talking in this film than there is you and I on this podcast. Yeah, definitely. Lots of sitting and talking. Even more sitting than you and I. Well, not too much sitting. There's a lot of standing and pacing and sighing. Yeah, a lot of sighing and, and exasperation going on here. Yeah, there's. Um, I think really it all boils down to there are action parts of this movie and none of them take place um with the character so it's just the character sits around and talks about stuff and then action happens somewhere else and um the action doesn't make the movie any more interesting so in the year 2030 we have a spacecraft that's landing on mars we uh we see all of this from the an exterior point of view of the spacecraft as it's landing. You can hear like communications amongst the crew member and the crew members and such, and they're all having you know a great old time launching and then traveling using ion thrusters. And they get to Mars, they land, things go bad, people die. It's very sad, very upsetting. Um incredibly emotionally involving since you never see anybody you just see a cgi spacecraft flying around in a sim- simulated mars i mean nothing nothing tugs at the heartstrings uh quite like computer animation of which this this film is absolutely rife with so skip ahead a few years later we have our our woman in her office job katie stackoff from uh, battlestar galactica that's what she's probably best known for. Plays a character named Mac. Uh, why don't you take it from there for a moment, Ken? So she's in charge of, there's another mission going to Mars, and they're going to do some investigation work to figure out what happened um, and maybe do some other things. It's, it's you know, 
basically it's supposed to be this big critical mission so they have to make sure nothing goes wrong and um the main tension in the film is between her and the ai robot that it turns out is is actually going to be leading the mission and she's just like overseeing kind of but uh it, it's made very clear up front that the robot is actually going to be in charge the robot's name being Artie, which is a very clever uh way to say uh, clever's in quotation marks uh, a very clever way to say artificial intelligence. And uh, Artie has lots of little snappy one-liners. And he he's your standard um, round, big white round metal ball on a stick that I think we have seen in, in some form. And I know Venture Brothers uh, uses such a uh, robotic device. I know there's a similar one in Moon, which was a... A fantastic, fantastic science fiction film about a man having a very bad time at work in a in a confined space. Uh, they should have watched that movie and maybe tried to make a movie more like that. Mm-hmm. Just as a side note. Instead, instead, they made a movie where there's a lot of dialogue that doesn't matter and it's not natural and it's very uncomfortable to watch. For minutes, and then for half an hours, and then for hours. I, I, I don't mean like even like like emotionally uncomfortable. It's it's like physically and mentally fatiguing, listening to the amount of talk and exposition. Because so much of it is just uh, fat. Yeah, you're gonna trim the fat and get us to the, the basic story. So here. like the real the real heart of the matter is that the the shuttle we saw in the first scene. Um, our main character who was in the, in the control room, it's her dad was on this mission. So she, that's what her vested interest in is in figuring out what went wrong or what, what happened. Um, basically that's, that's really it. Um, that's her connection to all of this. And it's apparently a family operation because her sister is also on the, I don't know, corporate board or like she's in charge of the company or something. So, so an interesting thing about Katie Sackoff's job. So she's like a she's like mission control, but there's literally nobody else there in this mission control room because of Artie, which you know you and I found incredibly odd to begin with. Even after it was it was explained that Artie's kind of running the show, it still didn't really add up. I mean, there's no press there. You know, it's a mission to Mars. They're landing. You're landing a rover on Mars. Kind of a big deal. I understand that the year 2036 is a very distant, far-flung date for humanity is probably going to be completely nothing like humanity now. And I'm sure society and civilization will have evolved to such a point that we'll find traveling to Mars so commonplace a mere 18 years after this film was made. However, comma, you would think there'd be at least a couple of people in this room monitoring computers double checking things I, I it just seems odd and granted this is a privately funded expedition it's a it's a corporate venture uspc or whatever they're called in this film even so if you have like a multi billion dollar venture you're going to assume that somebody more than two people one in some office somewhere and then your mission controller would be involved in the, the the operation of this. And she even says, like, when they're talking about naming the the rover, she's like, I got voted down. Like, that implies, like, there's a number of people involved in this corporate entity, and yet no one else is overseeing anything in this operation. Yeah, there's there's just hardly anybody in this film. And you, occasionally they, they cut away to an establishing shot of this building complex she's in, which appears to be multiple stories and quite large, and comprises of at least a couple of buildings. And there's hardly anybody in the building with her. Yeah. I mean, there, there's only it, five people that speak in the movie. And two of them are never seen. Aye, aye, aye. So, okay. So, they so they land this rover. They immediately find some kind of unknown object near an old rover. Uh, the talking head on the TV and Katie Sackoff decide, oh, hey. Let's send our rover to go look at this old rover and see what else was going on over there. And that's where they find the giant Borg-like cube. 
It's a giant black cube in the middle of Mars, just hanging out. Yeah. So they, they think immediately, though, they think it's someone else's technology because it's like this is a corporation mission. They think, oh, maybe it's another country or another whatever and they investigate into it to like drill into it, see what it's made of, all this kind of stuff. And uh, while they're doing their investigation, the the AI shoots another satellite in orbit. So basically this corporation has its own satellite in orbit that launched this rover and uh, to protect it from collision, it shoots the other satellite with a magnetic missile. Magnetic missile, which is never really elaborated on. It just it makes things explode out and then kind of suck back in because the magnetic field. Okay, okay. So okay, so they t- talk about it a little bit. They my, didn't explain it. It just okay. happened on the screen. Okay. <laughs> my eyes must have been glazing over <laughs> at that at that point in the film. Yeah. It just said mag- magnetic, and magnetic then, then the missile. things tried to okay, okay. attack back to each other. Okay. It ties in later. I, I, I saw that, but it didn't quite register. It ties okay. in later because the magnetic field is so important to the storyline. Oh, it's sh- vital. <laughs> so they never even really... S- ah, man. Yeah. I think that... <laughs> Talking about this movie is as, as exhausting as uh, watching it. Long story so, short, though, let's uh, let's not belabor the point. The the magnetic field in the atmosphere makes the cube quantum teleport, and it teleports to Earth for some reason. And we're specifically on Earth in Antarctica. Antarctica, right? I I don't know why none of this is explained or. Uh, Near a Chinese base, I might add. Yeah. So, so th- they they destroy a Chinese uh, Mars orbiting satellite with a magnetic missile, which then triggers this cube to teleport across space to Earth, a short distance away, in it to Antarctica, within close range of a Chinese uh, base. Now. If I were a writer of a film, I might connect those two events. Well, I they, as, as as a viewer of a film, I may assume that there's a connection there, Ken. Well, they tried to connect it too because they the the, the main character called her friend who's involved in the Jean, Chinese program. Jean, yes. So she called him mm-hmm. to like see if they knew about the satellite being blown up yet, but they never really tied that back into anything. They sure didn't, Ken. I mean, they. I guess they use that later on in the future to connect to the robot, like something being wrong with the robot. But uh, yeah, never connected it again to the cube or anything to do with that event of the thing getting destroyed. So this was a hard film to follow. I just want to put this out there to all of our listeners. If this sounds really stupid, it's because it is incredibly stupid this was an incredibly badly written film and it was not well executed and the, the the actual plot of this film is a complete jumble now we may be pretty early in the lifespan of this series and i'm i've said it several times about movies like it was okay or like i didn't hate it i hate this movie i actively hate this movie and i was i really was i i had my hopes up i had my hopes up i like katie sackoff I like sci-fi, the 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 establishing intro shots and everything. The CGI in this is actually really good. Yes. Okay, the these the effects in this film are fantastic. We also just for fun, not for the series, but for fun, we just watched another film uh, that just came out called The Midnight Sky with George Clooney, another uh, sci-fi film with fantastic visuals, and that film sucked. Yeah. I think we can say is is safe to say, and I as this movie began, I even looked at Ken and I'm like, Ken, I, I want to like this film, but I've been hurt before and I don't want to get hurt again. And like for a low budget movie, it was noticeable that the graphics were were good. Yes, and especially like in the office in the launch mission control, it all looked very good. It looks like a very professional production. Yes. But that's where they spent the money. But the writing is is very amateurish. And uh, one of the main writers on this is Hazraf Dalal, who is also the director and the producer and is a special effects guy. So we know where his his talents really lie. They lie in 
the visual presentation of material, but not the, shall we say, the, the poetry of the film itself. That has gotten completely lost. And this is something like I, I kind of mentioned just before we, we started, that this is another example of someone who has an idea, and they go, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? Wouldn't it be interesting if this happened? And they don't, they never stop to like make a character that you would care about. And so you end up with these movies where things happen and you don't care, the viewer doesn't care about any of it. And the reason we don't care, it's a classic theater blunder. It's the, it's the show me, don't tell me. These films tell you, they tell you, they tell you, they tell you. The most important things they don't show you. Mm -hmm. You don't establish an emotional connection to a character if all you do is talk, 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 and talk. Show us things that make us uh, empathize or sympathize with them. Give, Give us, show us experiences, show us events. Show us, stop telling us everything. Yeah. This is a... Especially when when you have a film that's essentially confined to two sets, three sets. I mean, you have a hallway, you have this mission control room, and then you have like a computer server room. This film has three sets. Okay, it's and like it all, really one and a half. One the and a half is hardly even a set. Hardly, and in all these sets, you have basically the main characters in all three of them, and she's the only one in one of them. And one of two people in, in what, two of those? It's it's just talking. It's walking and talking. So, and I think it also, part of what makes it come across as pretentious, as far as what I was saying earlier, is it's like, it comes across as, look at all these ideas I have that the characters are talking about. Um, but it just doesn't, it doesn't come across as like believable. It doesn't come across as interesting it's very forced, and and this also ties back into when I when I said it was an ambitious film, it's because they really tr- the director really tried to create a very highbrow, cerebral science fiction film. Unfortunately, he's not cut out to write that kind of a script, and it's incredibly derivative of other intellectual properties. Two thousand one, a space odyssey being. You know, probably one of the most common ones that I can reference. Like he, he simply was not up to the task. He even had a couple of other people, uh, Austin Atkinson and Gary Hall, help write this film with him. And I don't think they were up to the task either. And instead of creating this really deep, thought-provoking film, uh, it just feels like other films that have been cobbled together, masquerading in a shamble as it, trying to pretend to be something else, and it just gets really lost up its own ass. Yeah. And I think, too, it's like a, it's a big waste, too, as far as the main character goes. Because when you think of Katie Sackhoff, you think of, like, an emotional performance. You know, you think of, I mean, definitely a, 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 an amount of charisma and things like that. And it's completely wasted on this character that's just talking to a robot or talking on the phone. Yeah, the, the, the amount of actual humans that she interacts with is incredibly minimal. Um. That said, to her credit, I didn't feel like she was just talking to a computer or talking to a TV screen. It really did. I mean, she does a great job in this film with what she has to work with. Right. And it feels like she is interacting with other people. But the fact that she doesn't get to. The the problem is there's no chemistry, though. There is no chemistry. It's sure she's she's doing a great job. She's doing a great job. She's not getting anything back in return. Right. Exactly. And again, this brings me to Moon because her main co-star in this film is an A.I., robot or android or whatever you want to call it in moon uh i can't remember the actor's name of that one it is it escapes me uh sam rockwell sam rockwell sam thank you sam rockwell awesome actor he had kevin spacey portray uh that robot that was with him and not, there's there's chemistry there though but there's more going on but there that but, that robot can display emotion because it has different faces. That's true. That's true. Whereas in this film, there is no emotion from the robot. That's not entirely true. There's no emotion. There's, well, his light, his blinky lights go from blue to red a couple times. But that, uh, that's as close, <laughs> that's as close as we can get to for to him actually emoting. That's true. 
but there is more, I feel like there's more camaraderie and more, uh, there, there, there is a deeper connection in moon but the, between Sam Rockwell and his device. But the other reason why that movie works better is because you have an emotional character uh, attachment to a character. You absolutely do. And do you know why? Because in that film, he does things. He doesn't just tell us things. Yep. You see the character struggles. You you were there with him while he struggles and as he's doing these things. You don't get that in this film because it's all told to you. Yeah. Through these long exposition conversations. Like, also reminds me of uh, something uh, James Cameron talked about with the first Terminator film. About how exposition can just kill a film. And how in the Terminator, he tried to cram all that in in those action sequences. Like, uh, if you remember when uh, Kyle Reese gets first grab Sarah Connor and they're in the car. And that car chase scene, you know, they're running from the police and then they're hiding from the Terminator. That's where he you get so much of the exposition of that film to really tell you what you need to know. It was put in in interesting parts of the film. This film grinds everything to a halt to give you exposition. It's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. And I I enjoy highbrow cerebral films. Sometimes. But here's the thing. I can... Your audience, whoever they may be, you know, if they're watching a film because Katie Sackhoff's in it, there's a good chance they're Battlestar Galactica nerds. I was a Battlestar Galactica nerd. Loved that show. Um, love sci-fi. I've seen many great sci-fi movies. Okay, like I, I would consider myself a target demographic for this film. And I think you would probably argue the same for yourself. I am more likely to watch a film like this than I am, say, an Adam Sandler movie. I mean, that goes without saying in any year or any era, but yes. And they they just, they did this poorly. Uh, what what else can we talk about with this film? Well, we could talk about how it, um, as we enter the third act, um, we, we kind of uh, happened to look at the time, and realized how much time was actually left in this film. And I couldn't help but think to myself, where the hell could we go from here? Yes, where could we go from there? So basically, at a certain point in the film, you think the film's over, only to find out that there's still 14, 15 minutes of running time left. And uh, what we were really ultimately and, treated with... And a lot of that time is filled with just more of the weird space visuals. There's a lot of 2001-esque uh, space visuals. A lot of CGI acid trips. So that, that I thought we were just going to end with that. And then we switched gears, and um, this became a, it's all a simulation story. It's got one of those, like, quote-unquote surprise twist endings that just don't really surprise you, and it's not really a twist. I mean, at a certain point, you kind of see it coming. It just, it, uh... So, let's, uh... Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, out of desperation here, let's review our, uh some of our um, talking points here that we have typed up um, among those is uh, I think we just, we had just officially added it this week. Uh, the most useless slash extraneous character. I know exactly who I think that is. Jean. Yeah. Jean is the, uh, the guy that uh, Katie Sackoff talks on the phone to a couple of times. There was no reason to have another character for her to talk to on the phone. He, he provides, he provides absolutely nothing to the actual story of the film. He does not advance the plot. Uh, he does not really... His I th- his sole function, I think, uh, serves to demonstrate that Katie Sackhoff actually knows somebody outside of work. I think that's like his sole contribution to the film. But he was like a colleague. But he was still a colleague. Or like an old colleague. Like an old colleague. <clears throat> Just like Sterling. Yeah, the one man in the film in the scene who in, in this film who has any actual like on screen dialogue, also a former colleague. Yeah, now a government watchdog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that dude. And he's almost as useless, but he actually is slightly less useless. Yeah, he becomes less useless eventually, but uh, only only mildly so, and only briefly, and then he's gone. That's it. Yeah. 
So let's see. So we have so we have the guy on the phone. Mm-hmm. We've got the guy in the computer. Yeah. We've got the talking head sister on mm-hmm. the TV screen. Mm-hmm. We have Sterling, the brooding government man. And then we have Katie Sackoff. So we have basically a cast of five people. Yeah. Excluding some militant extras. A cast of five. And we see two of them on screen in the flesh. Correct. Man. And then one person on the video screen. And And the other two are just voices. They're just voices. And there's also some voices in the beginning. You know, great way to save on that budget. Just... Just don't just don't have anybody in your film. Give all of the money you do have to the one actual bona fide actor in this film. I mean, to be fair, Ray uh, Fearon and Julie Cox have worked in other productions, as did Stephen Cree, the uh, the voice of Artie. And they were all fine. And they were all fine. I mean, they're they're, they're all they're all working actors, but they're not notable. They're not really. No one's excited about them. It's like, you know, are you, are you waiting? Are you anticipating the next Julie Cox film? <laughs> no. Well, now I am. Oh, I, I, you are now. <laughs> uh, no, no. Not even a little are bit. You, are you looking forward to the next uh, Hazraf Delol film? If there ever is another one, um, no. No. If, if he's just doing the effects for a movie, maybe. So just looking up, okay, this this guy self applies the nick the nickname Has. So we're just gonna call him Hazmat from now on. Hazmat has, in his in his film directing credits, he has finished one film besides twenty thirty six Origin Unknown. And then he has another one in pre production and another one announced and another abandoned. And he has a whole list uh, of of credits for visual effects, also of, of films that nobody has ever heard of, which we will probably review in detail on this channel at some point. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I think the guy should have just stuck to being a visual effects guy. Yeah, like, like just, we said, the, that's the, what he's good at. The visuals were perfectly competent. The, the visuals were great at times. Much better than most. Um, Probably the best out of all any of the low budget movies we've seen. For for low budget sci fi, I was impressed. It looked like it could have been a bigger budget production. The telltale signs that it wasn't is A, you don't have a cast, and B, you have two sets. You know, most of this film was just done in a in a in a green room or in an office. That's it. That's it. So let's see. What do you think the uh the best plot point of this whole film was? doesn't even compute uh the best plot point so so i i I particularly don't necessarily have one um the worst plot point was the script i i had we had to stop this film a couple of times and just check in with each other like is this what is actually happening in this film because i was getting confused and a little bit lost at times i think the best plot point was when they had to go to the other rover to get the battery out of it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're yeah, so their fancy multi million dollar rover, after it first lands, goes to the cube. It gets like uh, it get it gets like uh, the the heebie jeebies, and its battery just magically starts dying. Well, it's the magnetic field. Oh, the magnetic field, I guess, drained the battery, right? Right. So they decide, oh, we're just going to go to the other rover that's nearby. And get its nuclear battery. And and here's an issue that I have with that. So RTGs, radioisotope uh, thermal generators, those are used on, those have been used on deep space probes for 40 years. They're on Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons, uh, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11. Uh, the Cassini-Huygens uh, mission also used an RTG. There was an RTG used on a rover on Mars in the last few years. And those work by having pellets, I believe, of plutonium or uranium. I can't remember which, but it's a radioactive substance. It's very, very hot. The RTG basically captures all of that heat, converts it to electricity, powers the craft, powers the instruments. Okay, this is Mars. Mars gets plenty of sunshine. Okay. Um, Not as much as Earth, obviously. It's 
twice as far from the sun as Earth, but it still gets a good amount. Solar panels are often very effective there. So you're telling me that this private corporation, which values investments and values their mission to the point that they don't even want to pay anybody to be in mission control, they're going to send this, send this multi-million dollar spacecraft, which probably costs hundreds of millions of dollars to launch, and just give it a really crappy battery. And if the magnetism like fucked up their battery, they're just going to go grab another nuclear battery and then that battery is just going to be fine. Even though that was in proximity to this magnetic event. Is that what you're telling me? That's what they're telling That's you. That's what they're telling me. So just magically, this, this, this battery is going to be just fine. And they, they, let me guess, like, so, so Rover 5 with the nuclear battery, that's Duracell, okay? And I guess they got, they got their battery from Walmart. Just got to cut that corner, got to cut that cost. Yeah, it was the gen- generic store-bought brand. Can't, can't bother putting an RTG on this thing, can't bother putting a solar panel on this thing. Of course, the solar panels wouldn't have worked in this case because the entire time that we're on Mars... We see just massive, massive sandstorms, massive wind, massive debris. There's lightning. It's incredible. And that's that's just so they could hide the fact that the background wasn't that great. It's all crappy CGI in that regard, yeah. I mean, it it was okay like in still shots, but like in moving, yeah. Yeah, they they definitely, you can definitely tell they were using it to mask some deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Which, and uh, just for the poetic license... I'll let them have a really like turbulent, insane Mars that probably, you know, hasn't had a storm like that, like since millions of years ago. And what else did, what, what else was I nitpicking scientifically? I guess the initial launch sequence Mm. that we see, uh, I believe it's like what, when the very first, uh, doomed Mars mission is launched. Yep. The intro scene. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a two stage craft with solid rocket boosters on the sides. So typically in a launch, the solid rocket boosters are attached at the sides and then they'll they'll be the first to separate. And then the second stage will burn for a while and then eventually that'll detach and then you'll have like your other stage, depending on the, depending on the rocket. Sometimes there's another stage or sometimes there's just the payload. So in this opening sequence, you, you've got this big, beautiful rocket with solid rocket boosters. The boosters fly off and then almost immediately... The second stage ejects. That's not how that works. The boosters come off, then the second stage ignites, and then they go for a while. And when that fuel is exhausted, then it gets pitched. And I guess for convenience's sake, or because they had time concerns, which I would find laughable, especially given how much time they spend talking, they just really compacted all of those events into a very short sequence. They could have just, they, that could have been a little better. And, yeah. and what else? Oh, and then the landing, the landing of uh, the, if you're getting confused, I don't blame you. We, we were, this was tough to follow. So, so that was the very first launch. The second mission that Katie Sackoff is overseeing, which already just takes control over when that one is entering the Mar- Martian atmosphere, like you can see like the heat the heat flames and everything from the friction of the gases as the, the craft is entering the atmosphere. And then immediately there's a screen that says entering Mars atmosphere in 57 seconds. And if you can see heat and you can see like the flashing around the craft and everything, that's because it's in the atmosphere. Okay. When people come home from space, Right, we, we, we build heat shields and everything to protect them from all of that because that's the friction of the craft with the gases in the atmosphere. That is all correct. All of that's correct. But this is a cerebral highbrow film. It's a, it's a thought-provoking mind piece. I don't even want to talk about the ending, um, but it's such bullshit. It, I just really have to say that. It, like, it, it, this was definitely a bullshit ending. It was just really bad. It was so bad. Like we were just ready for the movie to be over. And then they just had to put pile more on. They they just 
You know, you know, it's like like when you had like a really bad day and you, you, you come home and you're just like, you know, finally, I can just put all that behind me. I can sit down. I can crack open a beer. I can turn on the TV. I can watch the game. But like you open the fridge and like the, the beers, somebody drank the last beer. Mm-hmm. And then you go to turn on your TV to find out you forgot to pay your Internet bill, your cable bill. And you just, you know, you're out of luck. That's how I felt when that last that last little bit was still there. I was like, haven't we suffered enough? You just got to keep dragging this out on us. We need to suffer for 15 more minutes. You get, you're going to make us go through this for 15 more minutes? If it wasn't for the podcast, Ken, I would have turned it off. Mm-hmm. I, I would have turned this film off at that point and just been like, you know what? I don't care what's next. I do not care what's next. And having sat through it and watched it, it it did not change my opinion of the film. Oh. It did not make me. I. Uh, my my emotional involvement was long checked out, long before we ever got to that point. There there was no salvaging it with the, with the final few minutes, and uh, I could have felt a little better about having watched the film if they had, done something clever or interesting, but they didn't do that. To do anything clever that would have made a difference, they would have needed to do it much earlier in the film. They really would have. So what what the hell else is there to talk about? Well, let's see. Um, so relevant background information, that's a that's an area we usually cover. I think we pretty much covered it. Uh, it's a director's uh, vanity project. And he got the one, the one decent actress he could find uh, in it. And... Uh, Let's see. Best performance, Katie Sackhoff. Absolutely. Worst perform. Ooh, worst performance. Who would be the worst performer on here? It's hard to say because I don't think anyone had a bad performance necessarily. They just didn't really have much to do. Uh, I'm going to have to give it to, to Jean. Yeah, that's that's a safe bet. That's a safe bet, but it's not because he was really terrible. It's just... He was just a throwaway character, and his his dialogue was throwaway. Yeah, not that the guy who portrayed John, or John's voice rather, was uh, you know, he did fine. But I mean, anybody, anybody could have literally phoned that in from their bathroom, and it would have been as as good. Let's see, uh, soundtrack slash score. I didn't really notice it. Yeah, it, it was electronic. It was you know, it swelled at times. It was fine. It it fit it fit the film. That's good to know. Yeah, that's good to know. So, final score and recommendation. Uh, what would you say? You negative know? two. Negative two. I, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it a one and a half. For just for the visuals. Oh, okay. Tell you what, I'll give it one for the visuals and one for Katie Sackhoff. If you're a fan of hers, I think you'd enjoy the film to to a certain extent. Like, I mean, like a big fan, more a bigger fan than I am. I'm a casual fan. I wouldn't re- recommend this for casual Katie Sackhoff fans, but for those of you who back in the, the BSG days had a little shrine in your closet to Starbuck, then yeah, definitely check this film out. You'll, you'll enjoy so seeing her. If you want to watch a movie with her just talking to things, then this is the movie for you. Yeah. If you just want like lots of like close-ups of Katie Sackhoff and like that weird like wrinkle that was on her neck, this is a great film for you. <laughs> Did you see that, Ken? No. Yeah, just, I didn't really notice. She, yeah, it's just, you know, one of those, you know, she's got one of those age wrinkles on her on mm-hmm. her neck. And I just kept noticing it because, you know, I mean, she's getting, she's in her 40s now and everything, you know. Hmm. You know, just, she's not the spring chicken I she was. She fine. Oh, she looks great. But she has that one weird wrinkle on her neck. Just, I thought it was interesting. It was like, that's, you've, that's you've heard point. of here, folks, wrinkle watch at the end of 2020. Wrinkle Watch 2020 with Katie Sack. That'll be the ne- that'll be the prequel to this film. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. We're talking about it being 2020. This episode will not air until sometime in 2021. That's fair. We just we just revealed we, one of our we've secrets. We dated ourselves. We just revealed the secret to our audience that we record these in advance. You heard it here for, first, folks. Wrinkle Watch 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Wrinkle Watch 2021. Oops. Oops. That's okay. We can just edit it out and then maybe not edit it out. Nice. Yeah. So uh, let's see. I, anything else we need to add before we wrap this one up? Nope. Uh, if you ever find yourself um, 
needing to watch a movie, just don't watch this one. Keep scrolling right past it. I keep thinking that each week we're going to find a film that I'm going to be like, you guys really need to see this one. It's, this is awesome. It's going to happen I'm, eventually. I'm waiting for that one. Yeah. This is not it. Nope. Last week's wasn't it. The one before that wasn't it. Nope. So anyway, thank you for joining us this week on Complimentary Cinema here at the O&M Stockroom. We're your hosts, Brian McGarry. And Ken O'Malley. And we will see you next week and have a lovely evening.